Why did the Babadook go to therapy? Well, you could say his condition was... Monstrous. <laughs> hey, shh! Welcome back to Not Another Needless Sequel, where we talk movies and propose unnecessary prequels, sequels, reboots, and remakes. My name is Kane, this is my wife, my favorite guest, my only guest, and she's going to tell us about 2014's The Babadook. It's about a woman and her son. The father and husband have passed away, and the son's having some behavioral problems, but she reads books to him at night, and one night he brings her the Babadook book, and events thereafter happen. So the movie starts off with a scene of a car crash. It seems to be the main character, Amelia's dream, as she's falling back into her bed, and we see her relationship with her son, Samuel. Uh, I did read that the director, Jennifer Kent, auditioned eight and nine-year-olds for the part of Samuel, but she said... There was a knowing quality that crept into their performances that precluded the innocence the filmmakers were seeking. Uh, So they went with Noah Wiseman, who was six years old, both when he auditioned for the role of Samuel and when the film was shot. But you can see initially he was going to be older. And he is pretty young, which kind of shows in their relationship. Like he's just, in the beginning, you're really not on his side at all. Yeah, he's kind of a jerk and you can you can tell that he has like behavioral issues and that can just be exhausting for you know any parent and it's almost like she's in a little bit of denial about it from the guilt that you that she's feeling when I first saw the dream sequence I was wondering if it was a past event because it doesn't tell you Mm -hmm. you don't know until somebody mentions that she was like basically having like a PTSD some kind of you know dream of of an event that had happened to her yeah a lot doesn't get revealed about what is going on with her life right there in the beginning but i did think that that intro was pretty intense to see like just you know starting right in on the action yeah but samuel is annoying he's samuel is just not well behaved he's very loud he's always needing something And Amelia does seem very, and it's on purpose, and of course not to insult her or demand that anyone needs to look a certain way, but she does look very disheveled the whole movie. Her hair is always kind of not done, messy. She spends, I would probably say, most of the movie in bed. Like, she is in her bed quite often, and you kind of can see, like, Her life is not what she wants it to be. And as she's dealing with Samuel, you can see, you know, he goes to school. She goes to work. That's pretty much their day to day. She works at a nursing home. And, you know, her boss there seems to be on her ass all the time. She has a friend there, Robbie, I think his name was. Robbie and her seem to get along. You know, Robbie seems like he might have a little bit of thing for her. He's not a huge character, but, you know, we just get a sense of her day to day life. And Samuel brings a weapon to school. He makes his own weapons and tools and all kinds of stuff. He's pretty inventive, I guess, for a six-year-old. He brought, like, a crossbow thing he built to fire darts. Yes, and so Amelia gets called to the school because of that, and they're like, you know, he could have put a kid's eye out, that kind of thing. And, yeah, it's dangerous. I remember when I was a little kid in school... I think I've told you this story. There was this spray. I don't know if it was perfume or what it was. I guess it would have to be. I just thought it smelled so good that I, like, wanted to show other people. And I brought it to school, and we were in a class, and I leaned over to show it to my friend, and I accidentally pressed it as I was, like, showing it, and it sprayed in his eyeballs, and it was an entire thing. He, like, the (laughs) the parents came in. It was just not good. I didn't really, like get into trouble i guess they understood it was an accident i mean you know they talked to me about it told me i can't be bringing it that kind of thing anything outside of that i don't remember but um you know this kid brings guns basically i mean a crossbow but you know i thought you were about to tell me you brought like fart spray but that was like a middle school thing no people would bring fart fart spray and and spray it in the hallways i definitely did not do that i (laughs) that's where i thought that was was a good kid actually oh so or the teachers at the school want him to have a one-on-one like classroom experience and they need somebody to be watching him. 
Amelia doesn't like that. She says that Samuel already feels different. She's just going to get another school. And so she just unenrolls him in that school. Yeah, which is not good. Like, uh, parents, when their children are that young, can get in trouble if their children are not enrolled in school. Yeah, which they are in Australia. I don't know the exact differences in laws, but I'm sure that it's something similar. So, Amelia, then where we get a scene where she goes to uh, the park with her sister, Claire, and Claire is, like, talking about what's going on with her husband or something. Amelia is, like, not really listening. Meanwhile, you see Samuel and his cousin. Playing on a swing set. I was trying to think of her name. It might be Ruby. It is Ruby. So, Samuel and Ruby are playing on the swing set, and they're talking, but obviously, like, their relationship seems a bit strained as well. It seems like Amelia is very out of it, but also... Claire is, I'd say, a bit selfish. I mean, it's a lot of complex emotions and interactions in this movie, which is a credit to the movie, but it's not as easy as saying one person is wrong or not in their relationships. Yeah, and I think a big point of this whole visit to the park is that you find out that they don't celebrate Samuel's birthday on his actual birthday because the day that he was born is the day that her husband and his father also passed away in a car accident. Which I don't think they give it away yet. She just says, Claire says, it'd be nice for him to have a proper birthday on his day. And she just goes, maybe. And she claims Mm -hmm. it's because Ruby wants a princess party, and so they can't have a shared party like they've been doing. Yeah, because Ruby wants her own separate princess birthday party. And I guess they've had shared birthday parties for the first five, I'm assuming. Yeah, so Amelia is pretty upset about that because it's, you know, her having to face that she might have to try and have a birthday party for this kid on this day. That's just a horrible memory for her. And she does uh, go home and she lets Samuel pick out a book to read that night, which they kind of, with that scene established, it's almost like it's a nightly thing that she reads him a book. And he picks up this red book that you can see she looks like she's never seen before, and it's uh, The Babadook. And we talked a little bit about, you and me, what the Babadook means, and I, I read a few different things. It said in Hebrew, I mean, these are all, you know, just kind of close to what it is, but there's also something from the director. In Hebrew, Babadook means he is coming for sure. Babadook is also an anagram of a bad book, and the term Babadook that Jennifer Kent uh, invented for this is improvised from the Serbian word for the boogeyman, Baba Roga. It's the Baba Yaga. No. Eh? <laughs> That's eh? uh, Russian. The Baba Yaga. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he picks this book and she is like, maybe, you know, well, actually, as she starts reading it, she decides maybe we shouldn't read it. And he gets mad. He's like, you said I could pick because mm-hmm. the book starts to turn dark. I don't have the entire poem that's in the book written here, but it's talking about the Baba Duke claims that you can't get rid of him. He's always there. He's in a disguise. And when he takes his disguise off, you'll want to die. Yeah. And, and she doesn't read the last two pages. She doesn't read. The last read... two pages don't exist yet. Well, no, what I'm saying is she doesn't read the part where it says dead or something. One of the pages well, she's she does flipping not read. through, but yeah. Samuel starts screaming as. Yeah. So she's not reading it out loud, but she's it's showing on the screen and we're seeing it. And Samuel gets real upset and scared and he's crying. And then we see her reading a different book trying to comfort him. Yeah. But she doesn't know what's going on with the book. She just puts it away. I can tell you right now, if there was a book in my house that I found and I didn't know where it was from and then it said that in it, I'd throw it away right away. She doesn't do that right away. She just puts it up on a shelf. She doesn't throw it away right away. And that night she's laying in bed and that's the first time you hear the knock, knock, knock. Yes, it does say in the book like three sharp knocks and that's how you know he's there. Yeah, so he immediately knock, knock, knock that night. Mm -hmm. And then the movie, like a lot of it is almost the same. And this isn't an insult by any means. Like, I think it all plays into the way the movie works. But the next few scenes we get are just showing more of Samuel and Amelia's relationship. And it just feels like you start to get the sense Amelia has this disdain for Samuel. He does this weird... I'd be exhausted if my kid was that. Yeah. I mean, me too. Poor acting too. I think she part of it is she does have a disdain because it reminds her of her husband as well as she's tired. Yes. And Samuel, like, it shows she, like, gets a hug from him and she, like, gets upset and wants him to get away from her. Like, 
you're just wondering why. And, you know, I, I thought maybe he squeezed her too hard, but he's also a kid. How hard could he have, he have squeezed her? I mean, there is when they're laying in bed, he puts his hand on her throat and kind of squeezes. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's something going on with him. I'm not sure it's like he's trying to hurt her. So Amelia is at work and, you know, she kind of, again, is just looking so tired. And Robbie offers to cover her shift for her and let her go home to her sick son because she tells Robbie that Samuel's sick, but really it's that he can't go to school. So he goes and stays with Claire. And when he, or when Amelia drops Samuel off at Claire's, he says he's not going to talk about the Bob Duke or anything. But as she goes to work, Robbie lets her go home. She doesn't go home. You see, like, she's just having her own day, which is needed. You know, she's out there, like, having an ice cream cone. Yeah. But... She ignored a bunch of calls from Claire. And when she finally shows up back at Claire's house, Samuel was telling Ruby about the Babadook and scared her. And so Claire's very upset, wants her to leave. And she goes home with Samuel. Then Robbie shows up to check on her, brings Amelia flowers, brings Samuel a toy and says, here, my mom used to get me these kinds of toys when I was sick. And he calls him out. He's like, I'm not sick. And Robbie's obviously confused, looks at Amelia. And Amelia starts this argument with Samuel in front of Robbie, which I thought is really bad like to do that in front of people but also i guess it shows kind of that she is at her wits end you never see robbie again after that yeah she basically just tells robbie that samuel acts out at school and he's bad and so he's been kicked out and he's not allowed to go to school and you could tell how uncomfortable robbie is in that moment yeah it's really weird for him because he's been lied to and he kind of seemed to like her but i mean i even wrote down like he walked into such a, such a mess and sam just starts dishing teas like she won't let me have my own birthday or a father just all kinds of stuff but this is again just showing their relationship is not good you even see like a scene of her watching tv she's seeing like like an ad for sex like a rom-com and she just goes into the other room to do that and this motherfucker busts in the door and is like mom the babadook and like I can imagine that'd be frustrating. I also did write, lock your doors. Yeah, for sure. I mean, for sure. And then, so it's at this point that she doesn't believe that Samuel is seeing the Babadook. Because mm -hmm. the Babadook sees Samuel first. It, you know, he's the Babadook's in his room, so Samuel doesn't want to sleep in his room. He doesn't sleep at night. And then Claire has to stay up. And so they're neither one of them are sleeping. Amelia. Oh, Amelia. Sorry. So because of that, Amelia finally throws away the book. And she's like, no more of this Babadook nonsense, whatever. Then we are at the party for Ruby at Claire's house. And she's inside with the other parents. And they're all very condescending to her. They Snooty. all seem to feel bad for her. The one uh, mother is like, oh, I work with women who have been through similar things to you. Disadvantaged, I think is the word she used. Yes. And Amelia snaps at them when they're talking about how hard it is to not be able to get to the gym you know, obviously she feels that her problems are a lot more intense and they're just talking about surface level stuff. I don't feel bad. At, I don't feel bad about her snapping. You're right. It just comes back to what I was saying about I think it's very complex, the relationships and emotions in this movie. Yeah, I would like to say that at this party, Samuel was minding his own business. Yes. He was afraid of the Babadook. He wasn't being bad. He was just sitting alone in the treehouse. Yes, but Ruby goes up to him and says, this is my treehouse. You're not allowed in here. And they start arguing. Ruby is insulting him, saying he doesn't have a father. Nobody wants to go to his house. He's depressing. His father had to die to get away from him. Yeah, a bunch of horrible shit. And Samuel shoves Ruby. She falls out of the treehouse, breaks her nose. And so Claire is... I don't even feel bad for her. She deserved it. I do. It's a child. And mm. so Amelia takes Samuel. They leave and she like gets into a car crash on her way home and she just runs away from the guy that she crashed into. And her life is just going off the rails. He's screaming in the back and then he has a seizure or something like that. And she goes right to the doctor. The doctor is like, yeah, it might be this, you know, we can get you into a psychologist. But she's like, that's great, but that's going to take weeks. Can I please have something for him to sleep? Doctor looks like he doesn't really want to do it, but she gives her whole story. And she's just like, I can't sleep. I haven't slept in days. He's not sleeping. And so he writes her a prescription for one week of something to help him sleep. So when they go home, she um, is able to give him a pill and he actually does sleep. And they sleep until 11 a.m. the next day. Yes, at which point she hears a knock at the door and the Babadook book is there. Yes. And 
when she threw it away, she ripped out a bunch of pages. But now the book has been like sewn back together. Correct. And it also has added pages now that show her killing their dog, Bugsy, who's in the movies, just walking around all the time. And her killing Samuel. And then herself. And then herself, she yes. She chokes Samuel to death and then slits her throat with a knife. Yes. And so she goes to the police and she tries to tell them and... I think the police are quite shitty about it. Yeah. Which also, it might just be her kind of projecting that these cops were laughing at her because it does feel like they immediately started laughing. You'd almost think they'd take a minute to hear like what the whole thing is, but they uh, don't believe her really seemingly because she's like, well, I burned the book, which she does do. I didn't mention that. When she gets the book back, she takes it outside, burns it in the grill. And so and they're she like- she goes there with like dirty ashen hands, dirty face- Yes, and they don't believe her, and so she just kind of walks out. Um, throughout this whole movie, too, or throughout this part of the movie, I guess, you start seeing, besides hearing the knocking, she, like, sees, like, some coats on the rack in the police station. It looks like his stuff, and it's not like, oh, it was something else, and she s- saw the wrong thing. Like, it straight up looks like his gloves, hat, and everything sitting there. Yeah. But the cops don't le- believe her, so she leaves. Um, you also, she has a phone call with Claire. Claire seemingly doesn't want to talk to them anymore. And then, because he's been out of school for two days, and crazy that it's only been two days all this has happened, uh, the social services arrive at her house. Yes. And they are saying he's not enrolled in any school. That's not allowed, so... They kind of see that the home is a little bit torn apart, and she's, like, in the kitchen cleaning because she thinks she's seeing roaches in the walls and is, like, peeling off the wallpaper. Mm-hmm. And they go in in there and it's not like that but the kitchen is a mess there's dirty dishes everywhere and so they just you know kind of be like here's a list of schools we want you to consider we'll be back in a week yes and they things obviously aren't looking good for her in the eyes of the social services i do want to say like just because this is a scene of her like in the house with the social services and a lot of the movie takes place in their house i think that the camera work and like the coloring of the entire movie like i noticed it and was like they did like a really good job with it and then i read that the interior of their house was like completely built in a studio it's not like a real house and the production designers specifically used a lot of dark earth tones and all the props and furniture that were bought had to be painted darker so they could convey the right mood and i think it does that like you feel depressed in the house like it looks depressing correct so because uh social services is there she has to figure things out but she continues to not take care of him you see a scene where she's laying in bed once again samuel comes in and says you know i took the pill but i'm hungry and you said i need to take it with food and she's just not talking he's like i'm sorry to bother you like he really seems innocent and sweet in this scene like he's not being annoying he's just like i'm starving and she of course yells at him and says like if you're so hungry why don't you eat shit and he runs away and she goes to find him but he's like i'm not hungry anymore she tries to like offer him ice cream like she's trying to repair it but she it was a pretty harsh thing she said later on at some point, you know, Amelia has been seeing all this. You see the Babadook on the ceiling and it like jumps into her and it's yes. almost like it's starting to take her over. Now, uh, if you've read about this movie before, you'll know that the Babadook is kind of symbolizing her depression and emotional issues and that kind of thing. I wouldn't say that it's completely that. It does seem some parts are literal, but it does have like a meaning behind it. So it's almost like the Babadook is affecting her altogether. She can't cope anymore. And there is um, a scene of her like almost coming to and realizing she's holding a knife and coming at Samuel and he's like mom and Samuel asks her do you want me to call somebody I can call Claire she says Claire doesn't want to speak to us anymore I can call Mrs. Roach Mrs. Roach is a neighbor uh, an older lady she leaves her with her at one point in the movie is just a nice old lady who has Parkinson's that they mention but she does come up more towards the end of the movie she seems very sweet but Amelia actually yelled at her in the last interaction they had in the movie because Amelia says she keeps bringing up her dead husband yes So Amelia awakes at some point once again in bed and she comes down the stairs and she sees Samuel in the kitchen with his, he built like this catapult thing for his back that he claims he's going to use against the Babadook, but he has the phone and he's calling Mrs. Roach and Amelia takes the phone from him, cuts the wire and says like, is this the only way I can make you obey? And she starts getting just very violent and then she unfortunately 
picks up the dog. She just runs after it and kills it. And Samuel is in his room and Amelia goes up to the room and says, Bugsy's sick. We need to... Um, you know, get him help, like, we're gonna go. And she's trying to lure him out, and it just completely flips your perception of her having an annoying kid, and you're just like, she's gonna kill this child, and yeah. you're concerned about it. And the Babadook book is so far true. Yes, the it shows, like, everything that's happening in there is happening. And so Samuel's fighting her. I mean, he's using his crossbow thing, he's using his catapult thing, he has, like, a wire in the basement that you pull it and she can trip and he eventually knocks her out by tripping her in the basement and he ties her down and I'm like props to this six year old for doing all this because he could have just died but she's you know screaming horrible things at him like I wish you had died sometimes I want to do this to you and granted as not a parent nor a mother I know that there are times where kids are beyond annoying and some people have thoughts that they will never speak of and I can't speak much more to that but she's really letting everything out that she feels about Samuel and it's quite hurtful to him and he says like you're not my mother and he's telling her to fight off the Babadook and she does puke it out I guess she like turns around and black is just pouring out after she was choking him to death yes she does seem to fight back, I think, in that moment. She finally, like, fought back against it. Right. And which she, she does puke him out. Does kind of come back to, I guess, the depression part. Because, yeah, people say, like, you know, if you don't even try to fight back, not that it's easy. Please don't mistake this as me saying, like, everyone with depression can just overcome it. But for some, you at least have to try and do what you can to fight back. And if you don't, it is going to overtake, overtake you. Overtake you, yeah. So Amelia tells the Babadook to fuck off is what I wrote. She like is screaming at it once it's finally physically there. And she says, you know, don't ever touch my son or I'll kill you. Which I I did watch like this movie is based on a, a short film called Monster in 2005 that the director wrote. And it's very similar to this. Like there's just a monster in the home and a kid. And it's like nearly the same except they don't have the time to go through all the the book and all this shit because it's 10 minutes and in that uh short she also is like yelling at the monster and she says if you ever come back in my house without permission i'll fucking kill you <laughs> and <laughs> i thought that was funny because she does a similar thing here but it's she's like, like the Duke is her depression demon and she's fighting that yes is what it is yeah so you know because samuel home alone her ass he was able to help her get rid of it and then it doesn't ever go away which they mention in the book the Duke never goes away so it just kind kind of goes and lives in the basement i took that as like another like symbolization metaphor though like the basement is where she keeps all of her husband's things it's where she's never allowed samuel to go there's a key that she locks so he Mm -hmm. can't go down there and so trapping the babadook down there to the incident in which her depression started it made sense i guess is, is the word but she does they're outside gardening in the yard and she's gonna have a birthday party on his actual birthday and social services comes and they're enrolling him in a new school and social services is happy. And he's like, I'm celebrating my birthday. I've never done that on the actual day before. Mm -hmm. And they're like, why not? And she tells him what happened. And it seemed like social services was like, Oh, like I understand. Like they could kind of gain perspective of the previous week when they saw her anyways. Yeah. I mean, it, it seems like things are all better. Side note that they're collecting worms out there and feeding it to the Babadook in the basement. It, like she goes down there i assume that's her like feeding and fighting her demons yeah doing what she has to i guess to keep it at bay because Mm -hmm. she does see like throughout the movie i think it says in the book that the more you deny it the stronger he'll get yeah and so she acknowledges he's there he comes in tries to take over her and she just is basically like go away go away you yeah i did write down also like you know there's a lot of noises that the babadook makes screaming and stuff i we didn't even mention like at some point he calls her and says babadook duke duke but um the screams toward the end are that of mataro which is a character from mortal kombat and it says here ironically mortal kombat 2021 was filmed in adelaide in south australia where most of the babadook was shot Oh, that's cool. I mean, you know, that's just a weird thing that it lines up like that, but interesting. I overall, like, I think this movie is really good in the fact of how it tackles, like, this emotional thing going on, but I don't like the movie very much. I think it's very upsetting to watch, but I don't have criticisms for it. It's nothing that I'm like, oh, they could have done this better. It's just not for me. 
So I rated it a 3.5 out of 5. That's still a pretty high score. Yeah, because like I said, I think it's a good movie, but it's never a movie that I ever want to watch again. <laughs> uh, that's kind of how I feel. I gave it a 3, and um, I was very, you know, I don't like dog or animal death in movies. Yes. So I'll never be watching this movie again either. <laughs> also, I think it was like, it was just very slow moving. Almost like The Shining. The Shining is a good... I mean, The Shining is better than this one. But, like, you know that was my complaint about that movie. Is it just felt so slow. And there was very little dialogue in this movie. And it was just really slow to get to the point. I felt like it was a four-hour movie. And it was 94 minutes. I mean, that's true. But I, I think with these elevated horror movies, like, that's what they mean to do rather than... Yeah. Because you don't see the monster for a long time. And it's almost terrifying because of that. Because there's several scenes in this movie where there's no person. It's like you're seeing through her vision just looking somewhere in the room and there's nothing there but so often you're like am I missing something like is the Duke standing in the corner yeah. every now and again they do that but most of the time you don't see him yeah and that makes it scary I agree I agree I give it a three like that's over 50% yeah okay so for the game I am calling this game final girl you know in horror movies this is obviously very different horror movie but in horror movies there's always not always some movies there's a final girl it's a known thing. Sydney Prescott. She's one of them. Jessica Biel in Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yes. Jamie Lee Curtis in Halloween. Yes. Final Girls. They all survive. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a game with you where I'm going to give you just things happening and you say how you'd react almost like a text-based game. Okay. Like Oregon Trail or something like that. Okay. Okay. So, first things first. A mysterious book shows up at your doorstep. What do you do? Third way. Okay. The <laughs> you don't you don't even open it. No. <laughs> okay. The book. An unwrapped, unshipping box. Yes. Book of no. Yeah. No. Bye. I don't need it. I'll right. just shut my door. You're nosy. You'd look. No, I'm not. I'll just shut my door. Okay. You shut your door. Three days later, the book is on your counter. What do you do? I'll look at the title. The title says the Baba Duke. What do you do? Absolutely not. I've seen the movie. <laughs> okay. I go check no, myself no. to inpatient psych ward. In this universe, you haven't seen the movie. Okay. Um, Did you ever think to ask your husband if he brought the book in or he ordered it? Well, you didn't tell me I had a husband in this universe. It's everything in your normal life. But I'll ask you. You've never what seen the, the book. What the heck is the Babadook? And then I would say I don't know because it doesn't exist in this universe. Okay, I'd be like, well, this showed up at our house on the doorstep in three days ago and now it's inside the house. Are you fucking with me? This feels like I'm being brought in in the game, and now it's fucking it up. No, it's not. Uh, I've died of dysentery, so now it's just you. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's good. Well, I'll be in an inpatient psych ward. For the book? And for you dying of dysentery. Okay. <laughs> We're just going to roll it back and say that that's not what happened, and instead you read the title, and then because it showed back up, you open the book. I open the book. <laughs> okay, it reads like the poem in the movie uh -huh. what do you do just cross my heart because i already i've seen movies like this before i'm about to get got i guess ultimately your goal is how are you going to survive the babadook i'm gonna say go go, go away, away you get out of here go shoot go on, get shoot shoot i think ultimately that's why i said impatient psych it's all a thing for depression and okay, they can help me okay okay well i think you succeeded you're the final girl yeah way to go I'm going to try and play this kind of game with every horror movie and see if you can survive. This one was a okay. bit rough, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was my first go. All right. It's okay. You did your best. What is your sequel? Well, it's called... Wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. Normally when I have information about the sequel, about a potential sequel, I want to speak about it. So I need to say that first. So director, okay. uh, director Jennifer Kent holds the rights to the film. When asked if there would be a sequel, she said, I will never allow any sequel to be made because it's not that kind of film. I don't care how much I'm offered. It's just not going to happen. Oh, great. My sequel is called The Babadook 2, Electric Boogaloo. Well, that's why she's never going to let it happen. I'm just kidding. Um, I actually forgot to title it, so maybe I'll think of one in a minute. However, <laughs> it's not necessarily a sequel. Mine is like a limited series, like Black Mirror Mm -hmm. Kind of. Um, and I think that each episode should be um, a metaphor for a different mental health disorder. So I think that the first episode should probably be anxiety because I feel like depression and anxiety kind of go hand in hand and it'll be like the same thing. Like, it doesn't have to be book related, but I feel like the overarching feeling um, should be about that. I could cover others like bipolar, schizophrenia, PTSD, 
And I think something important, like the Babadook, like depression, like you can obviously try and treat a lot of disorders like this, but I think that's having things a little bit too light. I think that some of the main characters should end up dying, whether that be by like, you know, like if you have like a sociopath or a psychopath, like they start killing and then they're like, he, 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 I'm going to get away with it and they get caught. Or somebody is like so off the rails or whatever that they kill themselves. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that the point of it is like not everyone is ever succeeds at fighting their demons and it brings to light issues that um, people face. So I don't know what it should necessarily be titled, but that's my idea. Yeah, that's not bad. I like that. And I think it, it can help stay true to her actual like desires when she made this movie. Like it wasn't solely to just be like, look, I made a scary movie. It just yeah. happened to be fucking terrifying. <laughs> yeah, and they can all be, you know what I mean? I think, like, the thing about Black Mirror episodes is some of them are 47 minutes and some are, like, an hour and a half. And I think, you know, that gives the freedom to say what you think needs to be said for each disorder, emotion, whatever. I Maybe it should just be called disorderly. I don't know. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, it's, it's if anything, it's like a loose spinoff of The Babadook. If you made everything... Yeah. Like, it's happening in the same universe, but I like that. Well, I went a completely different route. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's okay. Mine is a prequel. Oh, you don't do very many prequels, so I'm excited. It's titled Mr. Babadook. Oh, how fancy. So, we open in on 1927 London. Wait, you know what? I changed my mind about the London. Undisclosed location, 1927. Roger Babadook is an eccentric entomologist in London. He's a bug guy. Or not in London. Yes, a bug. A bug guy. Bug scientist. Oddly enough, 1920s is when entomology really was blowing up. Oh, is that why you picked the year? No. I picked that year because it is the year that the movie came out that is called London by Midnight, which is where the director got the influence for the design of the Babadook from a character in that movie. Oh, okay, cool. So, uh, Roger Babadook is an eccentric entomologist in London where he lives with his wife, Margaret, and two children, John and Patricia. Roger works alongside his brother-in-law, Robert, which is how he met his wife. Margaret worked in an office to help with bills. John and Patricia were kind children with unique interests and personalities. John loved to make things with whatever he could get his hands on, while Patricia loved poetry and would write poems about her week at the end of each week. The family is preparing to visit with Robert for his birthday. Roger goes to work, however, seemingly to allow Robert the day off. Upon arriving home that evening, Roger finds that his wife had taken the lives of their children and herself. Inconsolable, Roger is cared for by friends and family alike as he throws himself into his work. However, Roger's brother-in-law, Robert, has stopped showing to work and has not seen Roger since his family's passing. As Roger's mental health and life fail around him, he begins to see disturbing images in his work, the spirits of his wife, children, and a mysterious dark figure looming in the shadows. So that's kind of where all the horror would come in. Obviously, when we do sequels, you know, I can't describe to you every horror scene, every jump scare, every disturbing image, but you can see where this would still be a horror movie. Roger's friends come to check on him as he has become a recluse, and they find he is not the man they once knew. Consumed with the visions he is seeing and wanting to figure out what they mean, he screams at those checking on him to leave. We get a glimpse into Roger's nightmares and see that he is being faced with the truth. Through a series of nightmares, flashbacks, and interactions with the dark figure, similar to the scene in the Babadook where Amelia sees her husband, you mm -hmm. know, in the basement, and he's, like, talking to her. Yeah. Something like that. We are shown Roger was not the good man we have been led to believe. Roger was a violent and angry man and abusive to his family in several ways. Roger suffers from undiagnosed depression, schizophrenia, and has been lying to himself to convince himself he is a good man. At this climax, Roger has continued to look for someone to blame in his family's tragedy when there's a knock at the door, three sharp knocks at the door. Ooh. <laughs> and it's Robert. Robert is angry. Uh, excuse me. Angry. Angry. <laughs> <laughs> Robert is angry with Roger, blaming him for his sister's choices. Robert has remained calm as he blames Roger, but eventually Roger shouts at him, demanding he leave when Robert pulls out a book. The book was a gift made by John and Patricia for Robert's birthday. The book is a red pop-up book titled The Babadook. The book describes Roger's abuse to his family in horrifying detail. Robert flatly apologizes to Roger, saying, You're sick, but I cannot forgive you. Suddenly, three other men show up at the front door, and Robert lets them in. We cut to a scene of Robert and the unknown men carrying shovels and walking away from some recently disturbed dirt. The last shot we see is a few worms sticking out from the dirt. Ooh, I like that. 
That's, like, a cute, like, that's so, like, laid out and, like, like, you put a lot of thought into it. Well, I figured she doesn't want to do a sequel. I do think a sequel would be not really good. Because I how agree. do you just, because the Babadook is, doesn't seem like something that's going to show up in someone else's house, you yeah, know? Yeah, I agree. It feels like it's unique to her. It all, She never really got rid of it, either. Yes, and so you either have to continue with that family, which I don't want to see that again. Like, we're going to do the same thing. That's just showing, like, I think that I would agree. diminish the first movie. If anything, I created lore of how the book came to be. And you can almost imagine, like, okay, so this horrible dude, is his spirit is the book, and he, like, is being passed around to people who are having horrible mm -hmm. mental health crisis, and, you know, he's not a good guy, and he's doing this as, I guess, revenge, but, you know. And Robert's like, now I know what you did to my family. Yeah. I'm gonna do that to you, Roger. Well, I mean, I guess I, guess I wouldn't really delve into it. Robert kill them, or did she ha kill herself because... You mean did Roger kill Or, them. yes, Roger. I shouldn't have named them Roger and Robert. Yeah. It's fucking me up. But You picked three names of people in our family. Well, all I did was look up names that were popular in the 1920s in Australia. Wild. <laughs> anyway. Oh, thank you for making it this far. If you'd like to vote on whose sequel idea was the best, come by our YouTube channel for the polls or let us know your idea with a comment, tweet, or you can reach us at needlesssequel at gmail.com. Links, as always, will be wherever you're listening. If you had a good time, share a show with someone, leave us a review, and come back for more. We would love to have you. All right, be easy, everyone. We will see you next week. Bye.